Subscribe with iTunes, Audio Boom, Stitcher, or your favorite podcasting app. And if you enjoy what you hear, like us on Facebook. Also, consider throwing a little cash our way by visiting patreon.com slash koreafm. And find more of our great content on our home on the web, koreafm.net. I'm Chance Dorland, and over the next two days, I'll have highlights from the Asian American Journalists Association's sixth New Now Next media conference titled Journalism in the Mobile Age, taking place right now in South Korea. Earlier today, I spoke with some of the panelists who presented here in Seoul, and here's what took place during this afternoon session titled Journalism in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. I'm Angie Lau. I'm anchor of First Up with Angie Lau on Bloomberg Television here in Asia. I'm also the chapter president of AAJA Asia. So as you mentioned during this panel, um, and it was kind of echoed by some of the other panelists, no better time to be a journalist than now, even with some of the changes that have taken place. Could you expand on that a little? It's just exciting because the storytelling platforms have gotten just so much better. The tools that enable us to tell the stories beyond just even a regional audience or a local one. It can really be global. It's the internet, it's apps, it's Instagram, it's Twitter. And even for me as a traditional journalist uh, working in broadcast, I have seen the power of being able to reach an audience even be beyond the ones that simply watch me on television because they just flip the channel. They can watch me on mobile. They can watch me on the internet. Um, and it's this platform that is a huge opportunity for each and every one of the journalists and future journalists who are coming up right now. It might seem really, really scary, but I'm telling you, there really is no better time to be a journalist. My name's David Merritt. I'm the uh, executive editor for Asia at Bloomberg News. And so something that you mentioned that I wanted to hear a little bit more about, you talked about automating stories. Um, expand on that a little bit more. And then also you kind of called this AI or technology um, buildup that's happening an arms race. Yeah, you know, when we're dealing with financial news, like we focus on at Bloomberg, I think every second counts for headlines. So if you're able to automate things like company earnings or economic data, you really gain an edge over the competition. So when you look at our major competitors in the market, so Thomson Reuters, uh, Dow Jones, or some of the newer outfits like Celerity who are cropping up, um, we are actually all competing to get the best technology together uh, because every second counts, sometimes a millisecond counts, um, and everyone's really doing a good job on this. So we have to continue to invest, we have to continue to try to innovate, um, otherwise we will get left behind. Paul Chun, I'm the Director of Interactive and Digital News Production at the AP. Something you mentioned during the panel that really uh, caught my attention was that while it might be possible or everyone kind of wants maybe mundane tasks or other tasks to be automated, you talked about the measure of success. Should it be automated? What's going to happen when that does happen? Is that good for the company? Well, I mean, in anything that we do, we always have to ask, what is our outcome, right? In addition to efficiency, what is it that we are saving and how we can reallocate those resources for a different part of the company that makes sense? So right now, with anything that's involving automation or that involve a lot of the technology investment, we're really being rigorous in terms of asking people, what is the benchmark of success? And we want people to be able to quantify it in ways that we can see, yes, if we automate this, it will save AP 500 you know, hours on X. And with that, we're able to we deploy those resources to produce X. So that way, we're not just picking automation projects just because someone came first, but we have a real system of evaluating or how to prioritize what to automate. Hi, I'm Heather Timmons. I'm a senior Asia correspondent for Quartz. Something that you mentioned during the panel was that um, when people are maybe interested in working for Quartz, you, there wasn't an exact way to describe it, but you, I think you said it was kind of like, that's Quartzy. We don't know exactly how to describe it, um, but that looks like something we'd be interested in. Could you expand on that a little bit? I, very often, it, it, it takes a, a combination of maybe cultural factors that are going on and an understanding of an industry. So not necessarily a story about, oh, I don't know, shoe manufacturers are making more shoes, but a story about there's an individual who has found a way to redesign things so that people can do it faster. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's stepping away from very traditional top-down journalism and, and trying to tell stories in a way that people can relate to on a much more personal level. 
And then also, you talked about how you're now open source for your chart function and people can take advantage of that. Could you talk about that as well? Um, sure, it's called Atlas, uh, and it is, this is the second iteration of it. Um, and anybody can go into Atlas right now and you can plug in data on a back end, create a chart, you can sort of fiddle with it so it's graphs or bars and mess with your X and Y axis. Um, the other thing uh, that goes along with this is all of our charts are now open sourced and that if we've got something that's running on Quartz, you can go back and pull the data yourself. Hi, my name is Sung Jun Jo. I'm a founder of Drone Images. I'm a photographer specialist in drone photography. So what we just saw during that panel discussion were some images that got a lot of response from the crowd, oohs and ahs on almost every single one. And you described what you do kind of as a rediscovery um, of maybe even things you've done in the past or new ideas. Could you, could you expand on that a little bit? As a photographer, the most important thing is always find a new and creative angle. And with a drone, I found it. And uh, as I told you, uh, many people just think drone photography is just going up in the sky and just taking pictures. But I don't think that's a normal thing. So I always try to find some rediscovery, so kind of patterns or kind of color. So uh, I tried many times and I got that kind of photos. Yeah. And something else that you mentioned that I'm also familiar with living here in South Korea, um, the laws on drones, especially here in Seoul, are pretty restrictive. Could you talk about that and how that affects your work? Yeah, especially Seoul is really hard to fly a drone. You know, you know for all aerial photographers, uh, we need to get permission from Defense Ministry. But Seoul, for airspace, for Seoul, the capital command defense control everything. So we need to get two different permissions and we can fly. And the uh, Gangbuk area, for Gangbuk area, especially nearby Blue House, we cannot fly a drone without the security team of Blue House, so it's almost impossible in Seoul. But except Seoul, uh, we can fly a drone, uh, except the no fly zone, especially nearby airport or nearby airbase. So if you go outside Seoul, maybe you can fly a drone easily.